It was only a few weeks ago I found out about the existence of illustrator André Helle, and he really should have had a place in my French illustration video series. But at least as an unsung hero, I get to feature him in greater detail. He was born André Laclotre in Paris, but started using the pseudonym André Helle in 1896, when he was first published at the age of 25. By the turn of the century, Helle's work was appearing regularly in children's comics and magazines such as the Journal de la Jeunesse. And despite the fact that his blockish style rejected virtually every convention of drawn illustration, he also featured in all the major Parisian humour magazines, including Le Rire from 1901 to 1915 and Le Surya between 1902 and 1930. In 1911, Helle published his children's picture book, Noah's Ark, and in an early demonstration of smart merchandising, he also created a set of wooden toys, and both sold very well in France. A couple of years later, he exploited his animal-themed success again with another bestseller, Big Beasts and Little Beasts. And in 1913, he wrote and illustrated the libretto for Claude Debussy's ballet, The Toy Box, which also achieved widespread acclaim. Before Helle, very little had been seen that was so dismissive of drawn reality in children's illustration, not just in France, but anywhere in the world. In monochrome, Helle worked boldly and simply in pen and ink and the colour work was produced the same way with the addition of watercolour washes and occasionally pencil shading. And for the doubters who think he just couldn't draw, this is a page from his sketchbook. Helle's published style was both deliberate and considerably ahead of its time. Throughout the rest of his life, Helle continued to produce illustrated books of his own, such as the 80-page World Tour in 1927, and there were interpretations of classics, such as Fable de la Fontaine in 1922, as well as contemporary stories by other writers. Thanks to repeated publication over the decades, Helle's popularity has endured in France, but elsewhere he remains pretty much unknown. He continued to write and illustrate for children into the early 1940s, and he died in Paris in 1945. And just like André Helle, very few outside his home country are aware of the Swedish illustrator John Bauer. In 1898, at the age of 16, he went to Stockholm to study at the Royal Academy of Arts, and even while studying, he received his first commissions to illustrate books and magazines. He also produced many oil paintings, and despite his obvious success as an illustrator, Bauer actually considered himself more an artist and writer. In the early years of the 20th century, he travelled throughout Europe, and his illustrated book about the people and customs of Lapland was published in 1908. The year before that, he had also started working for the Folktale Annual among gnomes and trolls. This contract alone involved an immense amount of illustration, and although he was stylistically well matched, Bauer was in the habit of regularly missing deadlines, much to the annoyance of the publishers. Early on, the illustrations were printed in black and one additional colour, but as the books sold in ever-increasing quantities, the pictures were eventually printed in full colour or at least as full as Bauer ever got, given his preference for a very subdued palette. Most of Bauer's colour illustrations for gnomes and trolls were created with a blend of watercolour and gouache, but as was the European tradition, it was the ink line which did a lot of the descriptive work. In 1911, Bauer's already unsteady relationship with the publisher started to unravel when he insisted that they return all his originals once published. And although this was a perfectly reasonable and legal request, the publishers initially ended its contract rather than comply. But after a year they gave in, and he continued to create illustrations for the annual up until 1915, when Bauer himself decided to terminate his contractual obligation. 
Bauer had never been able to rid himself of the notion that he was a great undiscovered artist trapped in an illustrator's body, and his frustrations led to him throwing away the lucrative career he had built for a return to oil, canvas and the pursuit of a reputation as an artist. And we'll never know whether this plan would have succeeded, because soon after, when Bauer was only 36, he and his family tragically drowned in a shipwreck in 1918. American illustrator Russell Patterson harboured similar ambitions to be an artist and took a particularly long time to settle on his eventual career as an illustrator. He was born in Nebraska and moved to Montreal with his family when he was still a boy. At 18 he studied architecture briefly and unsuccessfully at university. And soon after he left for Paris to paint and attend life drawing classes. But this left him in debt so when he returned to the States, he reluctantly took a job in advertising. Soon after this, in the early 1920s, Patterson made a futile attempt to carve out a living as a fine artist. And finally, in 1925, at the age of 32, he wound up in New York and turned his ambitions towards illustration. Within a couple of years, he shot from obscurity to celebrity and as his career blossomed, his illustrations of slender provocative females, with occasional support from elegantly dressed male characters, graced the covers and interior pages of pretty much every high-profile magazine. His strongest professional relationship at this time was undoubtedly with Life magazine, and the images he created were an iconic representation of the exuberance and glamour of the jazz age. In addition to his magazine work, Patterson also worked on Broadway as a costume and set designer for any number of popular musical stage shows throughout the 30s, and even got involved in celebrity fashion design. Patterson's line work was both highly skilled and distinctively angular, and when it came to colour, he used both watercolour and gouache washes over his ink or sometimes pencil line. But whether monochrome or colour, his work always had a particularly pleasing, spontaneous quality. From 1929 onwards, comic strips were an intermittent feature of Patterson's output. His first was Runaway Ruth, and others such as Wings of Love followed in several Sunday supplements. And these engaging comical romances were immensely popular with both male and female readers. In the early 1930s, Patterson's stylish colour work also appeared regularly on the covers of the humour magazine Ballyhoo. And from 1942 to 46, he produced a widely syndicated black and white cartoon series titled Pinup Girls. The last of his strips ran in the 50s and featured his blonde bombshell character Mamie. Unfortunately, during the 1960s, the onset of arthritis began to interfere with his ability to draw. So, Patterson had to settle for teaching at the National Institute of Art and Design, and he died of heart failure in 1977. American pulp artist Norman Saunders was born in Dakota, and when his talent for drawing and painting became obvious in school, he was awarded a scholarship to study at the Chicago Art Institute. While studying, Saunders tried to earn money by sending drawings to Minneapolis-based humour magazine Captain Billy's Whiz Bank. Fawcett, the publishers, sent him not only a cheque in payment, but the offer of a full-time job. Saunders gladly accepted, and for the next six years he produced hundreds of illustrations for several of the company's magazines. In 1934, he moved to New York to work freelance, and in very little time he was being commissioned by all the major publishers and the widest possible range of genres. By the mid-30s, his work featured regularly on the covers of dozens of magazines, and Saunders demonstrated equal of facility for tales of mystery, detective stories, westerns, and sexually provocative tales. Like the vast majority of American representational artists, Saunders worked in oil paint, and he was particularly adept with lighting effects and evocations of female flesh, of which there was as much as could be legally allowed. Early in his career, he created some monochrome line illustration, 
but the vast majority of his images were in highly saturated, engagingly vivid colour. And even his later monochromes were fully rendered paintings. Other than a spell in the army during World War II, Saunders continued to create all manner of lurid and delightfully unsavoury imagery for magazines, and from 1948 to 1954 he also painted covers for quite a few sleazy paperbacks too. In 1958 Saunders started illustrating chewing gum trading cards and among others was responsible for the wildly successful Mars Attacks series in 1962. But the cards sparked outrage because of their graphic violence and implied sexuality and the company eventually had to withdraw them. Much later, of course, director Tim Burton hijacked Saunders' imagery for his 1996 film of the same name and Saunders didn't even get a credit. Like many of his contemporaries, as the 50s turned to the 60s, Saunders was feeling the impact of photography and although he kept in work, he would never come close to his former status and earning power. In the end, old age and poor eyesight forced him to give up and he died in 1989. Robert O. Reed is a strong contender for the Most Forgotten Illustrator Award. There's no date of birth or death, nothing about his education, career or life, and we don't even know what the O in his name stands for. But luckily we do have some pictures, and from the dates of publication it's reasonable to assume he was born somewhere in the USA between 1900 and 1910. The earliest dated work that I could find is a 1931 edition of Collier's magazine, and it reveals an illustrator with a universally appealing comic style. One or two other examples appeared over the next couple of years, but it wasn't until 1938 that Reed suddenly seemed to become Collier's cover illustrator of choice. And Reed created many tightly controlled comic images for these covers and developed some trademark devices, such as frequent use of profile posing and eloquent facial expressions on his characters. In addition to the covers, he was a popular choice for the light fiction featured in their pages. Much of this was printed in duotone and placed with aesthetic balance within the layout of the page. With nothing documented, we can't know for sure what Reed's methods and media were but most of it appears to be watercolour and ink, and very occasionally he seems to have applied gouache for a flat finish. The volume of illustration he produced for Colliers in the next couple of years undoubtedly made him attractive to advertising agencies and their clients. The light touch of his witty press ads for the General Tyre Company in particular made for a very popular and successful campaign. And so was his series for Old Gold Cigarettes, which enjoyed similar success through the sheer likability of his characters and his semi-representational style. Oddly, by the middle of the 1940s, evidence of Reed's work vanished as suddenly as it had appeared, and when he died is anybody's guess. It's hard to understand how such a remarkable talent can be so forgotten. 